before anything else, I do want to make sure you are aware of the website that we have linked up there. It's also on the handout. When you came in, you probably saw a piece of paper. If you didn't get one, you can grab it on the way out. That's fine. They're out on a chair sitting out there. Um, on the back of the handout, it's got the different sessions that I'm doing this year at eTech, and the second one down is the one we're in right now. And so um, the website's also referenced on there. Um, and it's just byod.northcantonschools.org. I'll take it to the website just so you can see what it looks like. And get to the home page of it. There it is. So this this is our BYOD site, and it's um, and uh, always you know is a work in progress. It's you know certainly we're learning new things all the time. So if you return to this website later, it may it may look different um, as we add more resources. But just want you to be aware that everything I'm talking about today, we, we try to put as much of it as possible on here, and I think for the most part it really is. Um, I would say out of everything here. Um, Probably the most useful link is going to be the timeline link, which it's underneath information, but it's also underneath featured info on the side. The timeline link really is the, the main focus of what we're talking about today, which was our rollout. But on that page, so again, this is just pre-organizational stuff, so if you're coming in, don't worry, you haven't missed anything exciting yet. Uh, but uh, on this timeline page, I want you to be aware that I've got a lot of links there. So the presentation, the slideshow, that's linked in right there on the timeline page. So if you go to the timeline page on our BYOD site, at the very top it says, here's a helpful Google presentation slideshow. That's, that's the slideshow I'm going to be going through. So you can get to that at any time. And then throughout the presentation, as I'm talking about all of our different surveys we did and all of the different, so all of those are linked in here. So like here's, you know, our original surveys for the, uh, students and here's for the parents and here's like a permission form we did and here you know just all kinds of stuff you know got lots and lots of links and then our kind of post survey after you know our first year of doing this all of that information I've tried to make available to you and you can use any of it but I mean everything we do is Creative Commons I mean you can you can use it however you want so feel free to take and adapt or use it whatever works for you we've learned from so many other people I mean we're definitely not the inventors of all this stuff just it's our our take on it you know big thanks to people like Forest City Schools uh, Mason City Schools all those places that have really gone ahead and done a lot of BYOD stuff even before we did so um, we're always glad to share ahead as well um, so anyway I just wanted to give you a little bit of a info there just so you know whatever I'm talking about you should be able to reference it on our BYOD website as well okay all right well let's pop back over to the presentation itself and we'll get going here um, my name is Eric Kurtz and this is John Fano uh, John is uh, our network administrator and uh, very critical in the uh, successful uh, launch successful as, as it has been uh, of our BYOD program at North Canton um, I'm the technology director in North Canton schools I've been there for 21 years this is the point where you say oh you can't be that old <laughs> People don't say that as much as they used to, uh, but it is 8 in the morning, so. Um, I started off as a teacher. I was a 7th, 8th grade math teacher for about seven years, and then moved over to tech integrationist, and then moved over to technology director. So my path to tech director has come through the classroom, and I hope that's you know, helped a lot shape what we do in our district. I'm a husband and a father of four from kindergarten to college, and I'm an all-around geek. Uh, I am a Google Apps certified trainer and a Google certified teacher. Um, Google Apps is a big part of our BYOD as we'll talk about because it, it, it opens the doors for a lot of things when you move into the cloud when you no longer have to have certain software installed on a certain computer running a certain operating system when it's all web-based it opens up a lot of possibilities and so hopefully you know you'll see how Google Apps has been for us anyway very critical in our successful rollout of BYOD um, I do run a website called the Apps User Group website. I know this is not a Google Apps session, but if you are in any way interested in Google Apps, if you're using it, if you're looking into it, I definitely would encourage you to visit uh, the Apps User Group website. That's also linked in. The links are included on the handout. It's just a great website to help connect schools all around Ohio, really all around the country and the world, using Google Apps for education. So if you're in any way interested, I would definitely encourage you to take a look at that site. 
All right, let's get rolling. So first of all, let's make sure we just understand what BYOD is. And by the way, folks in the back, there are still seats in the front. If you're not sure yet, if you really want to stay, that's okay. You can hang out in the back and sneak out. We've all done it. Um, all right, so <laughs> what is... What is BYOD by my definition? Okay, well basically, obviously, it's, it's bring your own device. We, we, we know that. Um, and it depends really district to district what they define device as. There have been districts where the BYOD initiative was limited. Um, I've seen schools that say, we're just doing a, we're doing a cell phone BYOD pilot. And that's, that's what we're doing. And I, I know schools specifically who have done that and have helped them with that and talked with them about it. I've seen schools that are doing, we're doing a laptop only BYOD. That's fine too. I mean, there, there's a lot of options for it out there. In our school district though, we did not put any limitations on it. We figured, well, let's see how this goes. Um, and so for our definition, basically it meant any personal device that students would bring to school uh, to be using, hopefully, for educational purposes, uh, including laptops, netbooks, tablets, e-readers, cell phones, MP3 players, and more. And uh, what do I mean by more? Well, I guess the point is, it's not safe to try to define this list because it's always going to change. Um, one of the things that is not too far out on the horizon is the Google Glass project, where, who, who all knows about Google Glass, yeah? Sure, yeah, a lot of us have seen that. It's where they're basically creating um, glasses. I'm going to get a bigger picture over there. This one's bigger probably. Creating glasses that basically have uh, the equivalent of like a, an Android phone built into them that creates you know, virtual reality that projects things right there in front of your eye. So it's kind of like RoboCop or Terminator. Everywhere you go, you know, you've got this stream of information coming up. You could see somebody and forget their name and maybe it would recognize their face. And that would be good at a conference, wouldn't it? <laughs> It'd be like, oh, hey, John, how you doing? Yeah, how are the kids? Um, but uh, that would help me a lot. Um, but the point is, BYOD, I mean, what is the D? I don't know. It's going to be a lot of things. You know, we're going to see more and more technology that is just part of who we are, whether it's glasses, whether it's, you know, a watch from Apple, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, there's, there's more and more devices. It's not just going to be cell phones and tablets and laptops and things like that. So I am trying to keep the D pretty uh, open as to what the device might be. Um, so that, that's uh, kind of a starting point for BYOD. Um, and what I'm going to switch to, and we talk about why you would be interested in doing this, but let me pause for a second. I'm curious where you guys are at before I go into my reasons why BYOD is something to look at. Who in the room currently has a BYOD program functioning? Just a few? Okay. Um, who here is doing maybe a pilot of BYOD? A few more. Who is seriously considering BYOD? Okay. And the rest of you, you're just very, very skeptical of this thing. All right, that's fine. Skepticism is good. That's, that's good. Uh, and I can guarantee you, in our school district, we're still all over the board. <laughs> you know, so it just depends. All right, so let's talk a little bit about why on earth you would even begin looking at this BYOD topic. A couple of reasons. Quite a few, actually. Um, one is access to more devices than the school can provide. Now, I don't know about you guys. We are not a wealthy school district. North Canton um, has been hit hard with um, economic issues over the years. We used to be the home of Hoover Appliances, and they left, and, you know, that was sad. And we have been uh, functioning on basically no increase, you know, basically a frozen sort of spending situation for several years. And so technology-wise, we really can't provide the students with a whole lot of devices. Uh, uh, the computers are pretty old. The student computers are typically, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. Uh, there's not as many of them as we'd like to have. And they've got stuff at home better than what we can provide them, you know? Well, so one option is more devices. By allowing BYOD, you can bring in devices that otherwise you may not be able to provide to your kids. Another nice thing about it is the comfort level that the students have with the devices. It's their device. They don't have to try to figure out, well, how do I take a picture with it? Or how does it turn on? Or how do I? They use it all the time. So at least that piece of the equation is taken out. Another one, is student care for their devices. We all know how much they care for our school provided devices. Uh, the things I have found inside of CD drives 
I, um, oh my, I should start a blog, what we found in the CD drives today. And it's amazing. When you get to the high school, it's really amazing what you find in the CD drives. Um, you know, they abuse our stuff very, very much. So their own devices, though, well, I know, I mean, they're not sure, they're still kids. But they're going to treat them a little better than they're going to treat the stuff that we provide. So that's a plus. That's a good thing. Um, what else? Modern personal devices have powerful applications in school. What I mean by that is a few years ago, I don't think we could have had this discussion. You know, if we went back too far, you want kids to bring in their own devices? What do they have? They've got little cell phones that can make calls. Well, yeah, you could do some stuff with that. But now, I mean, this is, I mean, my phone's not even new anymore. It's sad how fast things change, but I've got a Motorola Photon. It's an Android phone, uh, but it, I mean, it's a dual core phone. You know, this is almost two years old now. Now we've got quad core phones. Are we coming out with eight core phones next? I mean, this is ridiculous. My phone is more powerful than some of the computers in my school that we have because they're so old. What you can do now on a phone, on a tablet, on a Chromebook, on different devices that are much more portable is amazing. It's really changed that. Uh, another reason is the opportunity to teach proper use of personal technology. You know, if you say, hey, we're not going to have cell phones in school, we're not going to have personal devices, we're just not going to address that issue, I mean, that certainly is fine. I mean, schools can definitely choose that. But eventually, the students have to learn how to properly use their personal devices in their life. They're going to have a job. They're going, I hope, they're going to be doing something someday where, you know, if they're sitting in a meeting and they're doing this during the meeting, they're going to find out that's not appropriate, you know. And maybe at that point the stakes are a little higher. And I'd rather them learn it now when we can have a little bit of control over that and can help them. And I guarantee you, this is a problem. I mean, I'm not going to make BYOD sound like it's just wonderful. It's rainbows and unicorns. It's hard. It is. And this is the big problem. Kids don't get this. They really don't. We do, we've turned on BYOD, and I'll tell you all about it. we got all these rules and all this stuff. But still, all they know is, all they hear is, I can bring my cell phone to school, which means now I can do anything I want, anytime I want. There's rules. I didn't see those. And so, I mean, they really don't understand the proper use of these things. And so that's been a very good opportunity for us to work on that with our students. It's a valuable lesson for them to learn. Uh, potential cost savings for schools is another benefit. I say potential because there are costs. You can't just do BYOD and think it's going to be free. I mean, we had to upgrade our wireless quite a lot to be able to have the access throughout our building. So it did cost us, but the potential cost savings is there that we don't have to buy all the student computers as much now. The kids have some stuff of their own. Another one is uh, student and parent interest. This is not something where you really have to bend people's arms and say, hey, come on, you know, we want you to do this. This would be great. They have been asking in our school district for years to be able to bring their devices in. The kids want to be able to do this. And we've had parents wanting to do this. We've got a, um, a um, English class that does a, like a problem-based learning project every year where they have to pick a problem at the high school and try to solve it. And so invariably, somebody always chose the problem of why can't we bring our own devices to school? And you have to interview a staff member and talk about it. So every year I knew I was going to get an email from some nice high school students. Mr. Kurtz, can we come down and talk to you about it? Yes, you can. And the thing is, I'm in favor. I was in favor of this. So I'd sit down with them and go, I understand. I know. I understand. But our policy is that no, we can't and whatever. So they've been asking for this for a long time. And so um, you typically don't have to convince them. And parents, too, have parents saying, why can't my child have their laptop in school? This will help them to be able to take notes and to learn and so forth. Um, obviously, not everybody feels that way, but there definitely is interest. And then the last one is why you should do BYOD is because you already are doing BYOD, whether you realize it or not, uh, you have a BYOD program. Um, when we started rolling out BYOD, one of the things we did, and we'll get into all the gory details, is we put in all our new wireless, but we turned it on before we told anybody we turned it on, and it was able to start tracking things. And oh my gosh, there was iPhones everywhere. There were you know, Android devices and iPads and laptops everywhere. They have the devices. They are already in your school right now, and you're running a covert BYOD program, whether you like it or not. Might as well uh, just admit it and work with it and make the best of it and use it for educational reasons. All right, so those are some of the reasons for BYOD. Now I'm going to talk about our rollout, kind of explain how we did this. 
and again, I don't want to make this sound like it's perfect. We're still working through this, okay? We've had one full year under our belts now of complete 100% BYOD at our high school. Um, but, I mean, it's not perfect. If you were to say, hey, can we come visit your school? Well, you can, but, I mean, seriously, it's not like you're going to come in and every single kid's just got a device and they're all working happily. We are still in progress. We are still learning, and I'll share with you our struggles and the things that we're working on to improve this. But this is basically our journey of how we've gotten to where we are now. So basically, back in the fall of 2010, this began with a lot of discussions, and it was really spearheaded at our high school. A lot of it was the principals really dealing with a lot of frustration of policing cell phones all the time, policing devices all the time, and folks who are very forward-thinking saying, come on, maybe it's time that we switch this up. Maybe we just got to think, how can we use this to our advantage? Not fight it, but teach them how to use it right. So we started having lots of discussions back in fall of 2010. Well, those discussions went for a big part of the school year, you know, like maybe, you know, several months as we met and talked and um, really hashed this out. Well, by March of 2011, we decided, okay, it's time get serious about this. If we're going to do this, let's let's start getting some hard data. So we put together a survey. It was nothing fancy. I mean, I'll show it to you here. Really wasn't anything fancy at all. Um, and let me zoom in here for you guys. There we go. Uh, so basically, it was just, you know, what grade are you in? Um, and actually, we did the survey down to middle school. So we went from 6 to 12 because we weren't sure at first how we would do this but we asked like do you own a laptop if you said yes would you bring it in do you own a tablet do you own an e-reader a smartphone an internet capable media player like an ipod touch you know something something that can get on the web you know um would you bring it in um on the positive side what do you think would be a benefit on the negative side what are you concerned about it was good we got lots of information from our students and actually what we got let me show you what we got Here's some results. Let's see if I can zoom in here for you guys a little bit. There you go. Um, I won't go through all the numbers, but basically what we found was 72% uh, owned a laptop, 28% a tablet device, 18% a, an e-reader, 50% a smartphone, 71% a media device. Now, when they say they owned it, I don't know if they meant they really owned it or if their parents owned it and they thought they owned it. Uh, but anyway, um, and then I broke that down by number of devices below, and only 9% of our kids basically had said no to all of those devices. So only about 9% said, I have no access whatsoever to any of those devices you're talking about. 90% had at least one of them. I mean, some of the kids had all five. Good grief. Parents, what are you doing? Stop it. You're spoiling your children. Um, but uh, I don't even have all five. Um, and then we asked, would you bring them to school? And it was in the 90% range, pretty much, saying that, yes, they would want to bring them to school. So if I put it together, about 91% 91, about 91 had at least a device, about 94% on average would bring them to school. We should have seen about 85% of the devices in school. Now, we have, and it runs a lot more close to 50% in reality. We really don't see that number for a, a number of reasons, and we'll get into that. But that was encouraging to us. We're like, because if this had come back really low, we'd be like, yeah, why even fight this battle? It's, it's just not worth it. But it looked like there's interest. It looks like, you know, people want to do this. So that was good. That was encouraging. Oh, so then we had more meetings with our staff. They were optional. Um, but a lot of people attended. Because once you start talking about, we're going to let cell phones come in school, people show up at the meetings. And so we started having a lot of meetings to really discuss that and talk about curricular ideas. Well, how could we use these? What could we do with them? What are concerns you have? What are some management ideas? So we really started discussing that in these optional high school meetings. We did a very similar survey now with the parents, asked them pretty much the same stuff. You know, does your child own one of these devices and would you let them bring it in? Surprisingly, the, the, their, their number was, was lower than what the students had said. Uh, I think it was close. It was still pretty good, though. It was still like maybe 70% of the parents said, yeah, yeah, I think that'd be fine for them to bring their device in. But it wasn't the 95% that the kids said, I'll bring it in, you know. So, no, some of the parents were like, you're not taking that to school. And that's okay. We understand that. Um, so, it was time for um, our pilot.
We did our pilot the last month of that school year because there was an end date, the end of school. Summer was coming. If this went horribly, horribly wrong, we would say, yeah, we don't remember anything about BYOD when they came back in the fall. What are you talking about? Ah, that was last year. We're not doing that. So it was nice to have an end date. Um, and so basically we took a month and we found 10 teachers who were willing to commit to this. Now our high school probably has about a, I think John, a hundred and some teachers. Yeah, I don't know, 120, 110. You know, so it was, you know, obviously just a percentage of them, you know, 10% or so of the teachers. Uh, but that was good. It was 10 teachers who were really excited about doing this. And um, basically we said for the next month, use this as much as you can. And the kids had to sign a permission form. There's a link to it there. And, um, and the teachers made it very clear. It's not just, you know, hey, it's BYOD, do whatever you want. It's still at the teacher's choice. So day to day, the teacher would say, okay, guys, today we're doing something with BYOD, you know, try to bring your device in, or eh, there's nothing going on BYOD today in the class. Please don't even bring them in or put them away or put them in the corner of your desk or something like that. And uh, we just asked them to do whatever they could during that time. And they did. They did a lot of interesting things. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the different things as, as we go through here. But, you know, it involved things like using the devices for in place of clickers and doing research and watching videos and all sorts of different things like that. Um, and they were, they were pleased with it. It, it did go well. Um, I say here this, the pilot was very successful. And I guess what I mean by that was nothing bad happened. And to me, that was one of the really important things. You know, there was fear that if we opened this up, it would be pandemonium, like it would just be anarchy. And it, it wasn't. The kids did a good job. Now, yes, it was a small pilot. It was pretty much controlled. And they weren't allowed to use their devices outside of those 10 teachers' classrooms. So they knew, OK, you're done with this teacher. Now put it away when you go to the rest. And they did a good job of it. So to me, that was a great success, that nothing horribly went wrong. And so that was good. So basically, that gave us enough uh, reason to go another step further, which was to upgrade our wireless. Those 10 teachers, we had just put an access point just in their room just so they had something to use during that time. But we did not have full-scale wireless across our building. Now, we went with, with Meraki. And I mean, we can tell you the pros and cons of different things we looked at and why we chose Meraki. They're here. They're, they're on the vendor floor. So you can definitely go chat with them. For us, it was a really good match. Um, I, I, I found Meraki to be very powerful. You can get about 100 clients per access point. It's, it's affordable. It's all cloud managed. So I mean, it's, it's a really nice system. Uh, so you can definitely chat with us more about that or just find the Meraki folks out on the floor. Uh, so that's what we did. And we put wireless all across our high school using that. So fall came. So this was a year ago now, in the fall, um, a school year ago. And so we took the first semester to really work out the details because our plan was to launch January of 2012. So the second semester of last school year, which is why we've now been through one complete full year of using this. And so basically we put together a committee and we wrote all of our policies and FAQs. Oh, so let me pop over there. I'm not going to read all these to you. You can definitely look at them yourself. But the gist of it is, if you come here underneath information or if you come to the featured info, we've got an FAQ section and we've got a student policy section. And it basically just told them the rules, how this is going to work. And I mean, I'll summarize them for you here. But basically what we said was, um, it's your responsibility. If you bring these devices in, the school takes no responsibility whatsoever. If it breaks, that's your fault, okay? We're not, we're not responsible for it. We told them that uh, the teacher had final say in the use of BYOD, that at any point a teacher could say, nope, we're not doing anything with that today. Put it away. You have to obey your teacher. We have certain areas in the building where it was pretty much fine to use it at any time in other places where there were you know, some sort of a condition. For example, uh, we said no to the hallways. Now, I don't know, that may change at some point, but the concern was if you got a bunch of kids looking down, texting, and walking up and down stairs, I mean, we just didn't want somebody knocking somebody down the stairs or knocking a tablet out of their arms or something like that. They still do it a lot. It's really not an enforceable rule. There's just too many kids. 
And nothing bad has happened. Nobody has knocked someone downstairs. Nobody has broken anything. So we may end up changing that one at some point. That's certainly possible. Um, but things like study hall, privilege period, lunch period, all of that, it was, yeah, just go ahead and use it. That's fine. If you're using audio, you need to have earbuds or something like that, we told them. Um, if it's classroom, basically, at the discretion of your teacher. In our library, it said, as directed by the librarian, but basically she said, no, it's fine. You know, just so basically, any time in the library, uh, study halls, privilege period, lunch, that's fine. Classroom, as long as your teacher says so, you're good to go. Um, other than that, uh, let me see what else is in the policies and guidelines or the FAQs. We told them, like, um, Wi-Fi. We explain to them that we do have a Wi-Fi you know, network available to them that they can connect to, but that they don't have to. If they wish to use 3G, they certainly can. Now, that's kind of a, a moot point because you can't stop 3G. It's not like you, know, you can flip a switch, the FCC comes and you get in trouble if you do that. So you can't interfere with cellular reception in your building. So you can't really stop 3G. And it's like, well, they just need to understand the responsibility of that. And we made that very clear that if you connect to the school wireless, you'll be going through a filter network. You'll be connecting through the school. It's just like you're on a regular school computer at that point where the filtering will be in place. And we have to do that. We have to provide filtered internet to our students. If they choose to use 3G, though, it's not our responsibility. Even if they're, and we talked to our county lawyer about it, made sure that you know we weren't going out on a limb there, that if they're in our building, but they're using their connection, that's out of our hands. I mean, there's really nothing we can do to control that, and it's their responsibility at that point. We made it very clear to the parents and the students that at that point they'd be using their own data connection if they cho so choose to. Um, I don't know, John, do you have any feeling on how many use our Wi-Fi versus their 3G? And if you have a gut feeling on that, a lot do. Okay, so, so from what John looks at on the network, it does appear most prefer to use our Wi-Fi. You, you're probably going to get a better connection than trying to get a cell signal in some other rooms. So for the most part, they use our filtered Wi-Fi. And it's throttled a little bit. We throttle video. We throttle gaming sites. Gaming, video, uh, Street streaming music, stuff like that. So we, we don't block them, but we throttle them so that they're not just sitting watching Netflix all day or something like that, which would kill our network. Um, so those are the basics. And if you guys have any specific questions at any point, let me know. I mean, those that FAQ goes a whole lot more detail. And, and I'll pause for a second. A any questions on that so far? Anything about our policies or FAQ or anything just so far? Yeah, go ahead. Throttle. Uh, good question. It, it basically means to, to, to slow it down, to put some sort of a restriction on it. Um, what we mean is, let's say um, they want to use video, and that's okay. They want to watch YouTube. Well, there's a lot of good reasons for YouTube, absolutely. But there's also a lot of cat videos. And so, you know, <laughs> and they're good, but, you know, you want to, we don't want them just watching cat videos. And so, uh, throttling just means that we put a limit on the amount of bandwidth that can be given to streaming video so that it just is slower than it would be if it was unthrottled. I saw some other hands, yeah? Um, with the throttling, is it different for the teachers? Like, for example, if you're using it for education, that is correct. Excellent question. The question is, is it different for the teachers, the Wi-Fi? We actually have three Wi-Fi networks. It's all through Meraki. I mean, it's the same access points, but it broadcasts three different networks. The one for the student is, as I described, for the teachers, there is no throttling whatsoever. I mean, it's obviously filtered because it's coming through the school. But no, I mean, the, the teacher connection is completely wide open for use. And then we have a, a guest visitor um, network as well for people that come into the building, you know, uh, coaches or somebody's coming to do a presentation or something like that, that they can get on. And it, it's actually even more restricted than even the student one. So we do have several like that. Take a couple more questions. Yes. Did you require the students that brought their own device to have it registered with you? Or? Good question. N the question, if you didn't hear that, was did we ask them to register in some way? No, we did not. Um, they did not bring them in and show them to us, and we somehow you know, took note of them or wrote something down or did whatever. Um, no. Um, we're also not putting any kind of software on their devices. We're not tracking them any way. It's nothing like that. I really, myself, don't want to do that. I don't want to have any situation where somebody says, oh, you've got access to my phone. You know, there have been too many problems with schools you know, invasion of privacy kind of stuff, whatever. I don't, I don't need that. So no, we don't install anything on there. Um, we don't register them, but 
the Meraki system picks them up. So when they come in and they connect, technically, yeah, we know exactly where they are and what they're using as far as their device because to connect to the network they have to use their student ID and password so it's like a, a login thing so I guess in a sense yeah we're I mean, there's no question if somebody says was you know Johnny Smith on yeah we can go to the Meraki control panel and we can throw in their ID number and absolutely we can find out if they've been connecting with what device and things like that so yeah I guess to a degree we do but no they don't come in and do like a registration yeah Are we doing archiving related to this? There's no archiving related to the BYOD. I mean, we archive like student email through with with, with Google Vault because we have you know we have Google Apps and we archive, you know, the students you know personal storage on our network drive stuff like that. But no, we're not doing any sort of um, archiving of the BYOD traffic or things like that. A couple more, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of great services out there like AirWatch and things like that. No, we're not currently. We're not doing anything where we're managing their personal devices. Now, our devices that we own, our mobile devices, uh, the, the Meraki wireless uh, system also comes with what's called Meraki Systems Manager. And that allows us to push out apps to our tablets. It allows us to wipe things. It allows us to do stuff like that. So, yes, I mean, our school-owned devices we manage, but not the student devices. There's a lot of great options out there. There really, truly are. But we're, we, we are not. Okay. I know so many questions. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Let's go ahead and we'll hit a few more things here. And, uh, and, and again, if this is one of those things that, I mean, I mean, today's the unconference day. If it's beneficial, I'm more than happy to pop into one of those unconference rooms later today and just chat BYOD stuff. You know, if we run out of time, that's certainly fine. Or just email me too. That's that's certainly fine. All right, so let's keep moving. I apologize. I will make sure we. Oh my goodness, we've got 15 minutes. <laughs> ha ha ha. Okay, so what do we do? We talk to everybody next. Um, uh, we talked to students, staff, parents, community members, Board of Education, or Academic Booster Club. We made sure everybody knew exactly what we were doing. There were to be no questions about it. We even made a little video. I won't play it right now, but you can watch it. It was a video that explained exactly what we were doing and all the policies. And we had our student um, high school video productions department do it for us. So it's student voices, it's student made, it's with our content. But we made that and it was shown to all of the students at the high school. And then January 30th, 2012, D-Day, uh, we rolled out the BYOD program officially. Now, after that came some more training. I wished I could say we did more training before, but you know how it is. You'd only have certain days that you can require training. And we had a waiver day coming up in February. And so if we had had one sooner in the year, that might have been good. But yeah, they're scheduled in advance, and that's how it was. So shortly after the rollout of BYOD, we did have a waiver day, and we spent uh, a lot of that day working on BYOD stuff. We offered about 20 different sessions, maybe you know four or five running at a time, and they could choose them and rotate through them, covering basics, how to connect to the wireless, the basics, what's a tablet, what's, you know, what can you do with a smartphone, what are some cool apps. More advanced things like um, using student devices as clickers. We talked about using Poll Everywhere and Socrative and Google Forms and how you could, you know, turn it into a, a clicker and do formative assessment in class and polls and, and, you know, brainstorming and all kinds of really neat things. And actually, on the website, if you're interested in that, if you go to the uses section on our BYOD website, and again, this is still growing, but... If you go to student response, under uses and student response, I've got a recorded video of the training I gave them on that. It's about a 40 minute video and it explains all about using Poll Everywhere, Socrative, Google Forms, stuff like that if you want to transform student devices into clickers. So that's available on the website there as well. So feel free to access and use that if it helps you. We even did problem-based learning sessions. Nothing to do with technology specifically, but the idea was we really need them to start thinking differently. If we roll out BYOD and a couple years from now every kid has a device and you come to visit us and what it is is 30 kids in rows and columns sitting there and a teacher up front teaching and they're taking notes, so what? I mean, we've failed at that point. They've taken, you know, 25 cent pencils and replaced them with $200 phones and tablets and they're doing the same thing. 
this needs to be transformative. We need to say, what can we do differently with technology that you know, we couldn't do otherwise? What does, you know, value does this add? How can, we, you know, how can we leverage the power of technology with maybe quicker feedback for the kids, maybe things that are more individualized to them, maybe with global connections, to be able to talk to people around the world, maybe with better collaboration between them. We need to think of other ways that we can teach rather than just doing the same thing with the devices. And so that was like in the problem-based learning training, things that we're trying to open their minds to think differently than just what they have done in the past. There's some pictures of some of the training. Okay. Uh, we also did a pilot with our middle school. They have not rolled out BYOD yet, but it was a good pilot. They had a lot of success with it, but it's a younger age and they're still working through some things. But we did do a small pilot with our middle school. And then, at the end of last year, we did like an end of year BYOD survey for our staff and students. And um, this one was very informative. The student survey asked them things like, um, do you own these devices? But now, not would you bring them in, did you bring them in? That was very interesting to find out. Those kids who owned them, but chose not to bring them in. And then if you owned it and didn't bring it in, why didn't you? bring the device in, and then how did you use it, where did you use it, what was good, what was bad, what would you change. Now, I should have this pulled up here somewhere. I think here it is. I should zoom out a little bit here. All right. Uh, let me go to our summary. So I won't go through all the details of it, but you'll see that this shows, you know, the kids who brought devices in, like with laptops, uh, about 30% brought their device in with tablets. Um, looks like 18% who owned one brought them in. E-readers, it looks like about 15% who owned one, or 15% brought one in. Obviously, not many owned them. Smartphones, pretty much 50% of the kids, if you owned it, you brought it in. Very, very few didn't, and on and on and on. Again, we, we were shooting around 50% when you throw all the devices together. Here's the real telling thing, though. If you owned a device and didn't bring it in, why didn't you bring it in? The biggest reason given, 52%, said I didn't want it to get damaged or stolen. Okay? So that's an understandable concern. Um, so far, that hasn't happened. We haven't had a lot of people having things break. So hopefully over time, I don't think we've had anything really. I don't think there's been anything stolen. So... Um, Hopefully that will go down over time. And then some, you know, 17% said my parents wouldn't allow me. Okay, hopefully over time that will go down too as the parents become more comfortable with the program. My concern was the one that 42% of the kids said, I did not have a need for the device at school. So that means there hasn't been a change in a lot of the classrooms yet. And that's okay. I understand. It's not that, you know, you know, that teachers are necessarily against it, it's that you need a lot of PD, you need a lot of training, you need a lot of time, you need to really help people see how could we use this in class, um, and it's sort of a chicken egg problem. If you don't have a reason to use it, kids aren't probably going to bring it in, and if they don't bring it in, you might not have a critical mass in class to be able to use it so much, so it's tough. But that's, that's something that we are working on. But I can, you know, give you more details on that survey later if that's useful to you. All right. Um, so what have we used BYOD for? Lots of things. And again, I'd love to talk in more detail about them, but I'll give you the basics. These are kind of in order based upon how the students responded to that survey. So research is typically the most common answer given. Kids are using it to Google stuff. They're looking stuff up in class. It's, it's research. It's helping them get information. Uh, productivity. We're processing multimedia presentations depending upon the device. Some things lend themselves more to that than others, although you'd be amazed what kids can type up on a phone. It's crazy. Uh, they'll do it. Um, student response systems, we mentioned that as clickers. We've used them for formative assessments, for polls in class, for um, brainstorming, things like that. Um, subject specific apps, just depends on the class. If it's you know, Spanish, it's a translation app, or it's math, and it's a graphing calculator, or whatever the case might be. Uh, taking notes. We've got some kids, this just works for them. One of our science teachers said she had some students who said, I, I want to use my device for taking notes. And she said to them, that's fine, but I can't wait for you. If you can keep up, that's fine. I can't. I have a speed I have to move at in class to get through this, sort of like we're running out of time here today. And she's like, if you can keep up, that's fine. But if you can't, I'm, I'm sorry. And 
which is really smart. She goes, I want you to do, how long did you tell them to try it out? For a couple of weeks? And she said, I want to see your notes. Did, didn't she say that for the first few weeks? I want to see your notes because I don't want you getting sloppy notes. If, if you're going to use technology and it turns out that you've got subpar notes, I'm going to tell you, no, you're not allowed to use it. So this group of kids went ahead and used, and I don't even remember what they were using. I think it was an iOS app, I think. Think. I know a lot of them have been using um, Evernote as well, but I don't think it was Evernote. And so she she said, show me your, your notes. She said, they were better than the other students by far. They had really good detail, but they also had hyperlinks out to reference material. They had pictures of the demonstrations that were going on in the science lab. They had, you know, snapshots of the, of the, of the you know, whatever she was projecting on the screen. They had links to the teacher's presentation. It was great. She goes, wow, you did it, you know. And so for those kids, it's really worked. Okay? And I think that might be one of the better examples of BYOD right now is that, please understand, it's not like we've got this, you know, 100% all across the board, all teachers, everybody using BYOD. We've got pockets that are using it more successfully than others, but we've got students who on their own initiative are now free to use it. There's nobody saying, no, you can't do that. So they're finding ways to use technology that works for them, things that make it easier for them to learn, and we're no longer stopping them from doing that. And that's been very helpful for us. Uh, watching subject-related videos, that's a good one. Um, digital textbooks, some of our books do have a digital version. They use that. Reading novels, of course. Um, email, we're Google Apps district, so they communicate with their teachers through email. QR codes are great. Obviously, got those on the back of my little handout there. You're probably familiar with QR codes now. Great way to be able to get information to kids quickly. I could. They got a, actually, I've got a, on the BYOD website, check that out too. I've got a whole section on QR codes under uses that goes into like 15 different ways to use it in class and has all kinds of stuff on there. And um, inquiry learning, um, all of these things were basically things we have seen our students using BYOD for, which has been encouraging that we've seen some positive things come from it. But there have been challenges. I don't want to make it sound like this is perfect. The ones that always come up, equity always comes up, uh, damage and theft always comes up, and misuse always comes up. Now, I've added in there the uh, tech integration part of it, getting it integrated into your curriculum, using it for things. But the, the three of equity, damage and theft, and misuse always show up on any survey we ever do. When we ask students or parents or staff, what are you worried about? Those come up all the time. Um, so real quick, with equity, there's a couple of ways to address that. One is to share devices, and it depends. If you're just doing a poll in class, you probably can do that. You can say, okay, when you're done, do you mind just passing your phone to the kid next to you and letting them hit A, B, C, D on the poll? And that works in some cases. So sometimes you can share devices. Other times, it's doing activities that don't require 100% of devices. You don't always have to have every student with a device. You can have things where it's group work and one person is doing the device thing and somebody else is doing something different. They don't always have to be on a device at all times. We've seen a lot of kids pairing up and that works well. Another is trying to have extra devices available that you can make available to, well, we don't have money, <laughs> so uh, we haven't been able to do a lot of that, but I will show you something we're trying. It's still kind of new, and it's starting to pick up some steam. We've done a program called Smartphones for Smarter Kids, where we have reached out to our parents in our community, and we're asking them to donate their old devices to us, because I guarantee you, if you've got a smartphone right now, the next time you upgrade to the whatever, whatever version of your phone is next, you're going to no longer need this old phone you have, and I guarantee you, it's good enough. It is good enough for our kids. And I, I realized this when I upgraded my phone. My wife and I upgraded our phones. Like Again, this is almost two years old now, but we freed up some HTC Heroes or something like that. And I've got three little boys at home, and I realized, hey, they're always wanting to borrow my phone. I'll just give them my old phone. So I wiped them clean attach them to the Wi-Fi at home. They don't use cellular now because obviously that phone's no longer in service because I got a new phone, but it connects to the Wi-Fi fine. And now my kids could play Angry Birds and they could do whatever on those old phones. So I went, hey, and it gave me an idea. And so we've been doing the Smartphone for Smarter Kids program and we've started to get some phones. Things are starting to come in. It's going to take some time, but my, my plan is basically to bring them in, wipe the phones, connect them to our Meraki Systems Manager program that sort of manages them, and then put them in like packs of 10 or something so that you can say, okay, teachers, 
If you want to do something BYOD, feel free to grab a cell phone pack or a tablet pack or whatever pack. And if you need to fill in that extra gap in the class of kids who don't have something, they could pick one of these up, have a big NCCS on the back for North Canton or something like that, and they could use those during class. So we're trying to find creative ways to have more devices available for the kids. Uh, we're pretty much out of time, so I'm going to talk real fast here. Uh, concern about potential damage or theft. So far, really no problems. That is a concern, but we really have not. We truly haven't had issues with that. Uh, converting traditional lessons to technology integrated learning experiences, that's a challenge. Uh, it's just PD. You just, we're, we're still working on it. We're offering more PD. We're just trying to help them see ways that they can use technology in their classroom to do things differently. And then potential misuses of devices, yeah, it's a problem. There's no, like I told you earlier, the kids feel entitled. They feel that if they are allowed to bring it in, they should be able to, bell hasn't rung, you can't tell me what to do. You know, you're done teaching, okay, you know, five minutes left in class, no problem. And there's a lot, they, the, kid, the kids gotta learn etiquette. They just really do, and they, they don't understand it. And so we're working on that with them, and we're putting together, you know, resources for the teachers to help them understand, here's things you can do in class. Now, some teachers do it in a more negative way. I don't mean that in a bad, but like, if you do something wrong, I will take your device away. Here, put it up in this box, put it in the cell phone jail, and you can get it back later, okay? Others do it with a more, maybe a positive twist to it. I'm not saying one's better than the other. They'll just say, okay, if everybody uses their devices well this week, on Friday, you can just listen to music, you know, during the study time or something like that, and uses the, the devices as a, as a positive sort of thing to encourage the kids to use it right. But it's lots of stuff. It's walking around the classroom as much as you can, and it's, um, you know, having to tell them, okay, we're not using the devices right now. Put them in the corner of your desk so we can see them. But they're creative. I mean, they'll probably put a dummy device there and text on the one down here. They'll find a way. They will find a way. But it also means a lot of support from, from our principals. If kids misuse this, they, they get in trouble. I mean, they get banned from the, we can, we can knock them off the wireless network and say, that's it. You cannot log on to our wireless network now. You, know? you can't have a device here at school for X number of days or weeks or something like that. All right. Um, Oh, I think that's the end of my slide uh, deck there. So anyway, that's where we've come from. That's where we're at. It's still a ways to go. Uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that this is going to, you know, keep growing. Um, but I would say check out the BYOD website over time. As we continue to develop, we'll put more stuff there. And definitely contact me if you have questions about that. We don't have all the answers, but we are trying to work through this. Um, if you are interested in talking to me some more, I'll definitely have two more things going on this uh, this conference, I've got a Picasso Web Albums training today at 3 and the Live State of Tech podcast tomorrow at noon. And other than that, thanks guys so much for coming early in the morning. Have a great, great conference.